Memory is the most reliable source of information. And so in researching the book, to get the story right, I had to go back to the very earliest sources I could find that talked about the events as they unfolded. It's interesting, a couple of Emmett Till's cousins who were with him at the store, they've talked about this over the years. They talked about it in documentaries and they give, they've given speeches too. One of them just passed away about five months ago. But uh, they've been, both until recently, been very active in speaking. And to see what they said in 1955 as opposed to today, sometimes that differs. It's not because anybody's lying, it's just that memory does that to us. And so I was determined to go back to the earliest sources and try to get the case right. Now one of the things that um, I had to determine right off the bat, I knew I'd have people mad at me, uh, which is I guess good. If you wrote a book where everybody liked it, um, you kind of almost want some people to be, you know, somebody on this side thinking you didn't go far enough, so on this side thinking you went too far. You realize that, yeah, there maybe there's some good balance here. And as long as I got enough people mad at me, I guess I did okay. So, uh, and that's kind of happened to an extent, although people in general have really liked the book and it's received good reviews. Um, I was nervous about trying to determine what happened at the store with Emmett Till because uh, Emmett's mother, uh, later in life, uh, after about the 30 year anniversary of the case, when she would talk, she would talk that Emmett really didn't whistle at Carolyn Bryant. He had a stutter and to stop the stutter he would uh, sometimes just whistle to try to blow out a word that she said she had taught him to do this. And I noticed she wasn't saying that in the 50s and 60s when she, or in the 50s when she spoke. She just said Emmett didn't know how to whistle and that I could whistle better than him and she used to tease him about that. And so I thought, well, first of all, she wasn't there that day, so I had to rely, even if she did teach him that, that doesn't necessarily mean every time he whistled the rest of his life, it was always to, to blow out a, a stutter. So I talked to his cousins, who were very adamant early on, even the day after the event at the store, that yes, they told the press right away, uh, the black press, the, the northern press, the southern white press, that Emmett did whistle at Carolyn Bryant. They were the source of that. It wasn't Carolyn, it wasn't the Roy and J.W. Milam, it wasn't anybody else but his cousins. They were the ones that told the press that Emmett had whistled, and they were very adamant about it. Emmett's cousin, Maurice, said that when he whistled at her, I said, man, you know better than that, and he just kind of laughed. So taking all the earliest sources, there's a few contradictions here and there, but the earliest references to this was, came from Emmett's cousins that he did indeed whistle at Carolyn Bryant. Now, does that mean he should have been killed? No. Does it mean he really did anything wrong? I was 14 once, and guess what I did when I was 14? I whistled at girls, or I would flirt with them, or I remember once a girl drove by in a car, and I, I got her attention, and I said something really flirty to her, and she gave me this dirty look and drove off and stuff, and I was about that age. And so that's just, you know, and nobody tried to kill me over it. And so Emmett didn't do anything wrong, and, and this need to sanitize the behavior to make him innocent, I think, is sad because he didn't do anything to deserve any kind of punishment. But sometimes there's this need in our minds to sanitize him of doing anything. Otherwise, we think that, well, maybe he got what he was, had coming. And I've heard people say that. I've heard many people say, oh, he just got what he had coming. And, and in order to think that, they have to kind of erase the whistle and that's erasing history when you do that. You don't need to do that because again, Emmett didn't do anything to deserve anything. He was a 14 year old boy whistling at a girl that he thought was probably single. She was very petite. He wouldn't have known she was married because he didn't know who she was. She was white. That was the only thing that he did that he could have done up north and not done in the south. So, and I spent a lot of time, if you go to the footnotes in chapter two, chapter two where I talk about this, Look at the footnotes because I go into a lot of detail as to why I reached the conclusions I did, why I went through so many sources to try to clear up myths and things like that. So that was a part of this journey. Another pivotal moment for me, now I talked about meeting, uh, or I never did get to meet her in person sadly, but I talked to Mamie Till Mobley over the phone regularly for eight, for six years. She came to know my kids, uh, it was a great experience. And so that made the case personal. Another thing that made the case kind of personal for me where I was felt like I was, had entered history myself 
was during the FBI investigation, they um, exhumed Emmett Till's body because they did an autopsy. They needed to. The defense argument in 1955 was that the body that was buried was not Emmett Till. That's what the defense tried to say. They said the body was too, you know, you've seen the photo of Emmett Till in Jet Magazine. And they tried to make the argument, the defense, that that body was so badly damaged that you couldn't tell who it was. And so that maybe was somebody else other than Emmett Till. And so the, the jury used that argument as an excuse, really, to acquit these men. When interviewed later, they said the state didn't prove anything. We don't know who that was. Could have been somebody different. And so now with our abilities today to prove through DNA testing and that, who that body would have been, really wanted to eliminate that argument right off the bat. So in 2005, Emmett Till's body was exhumed. They did an autopsy, learned much more the extent of the damage to him. The, everybody saw his battered face, didn't realize that other bones in his body and his wrists and legs and that had, already, had also been broken. So this beating he, and torture that he underwent, we learned was much worse than we thought before. But when they buried Emmett Till, after determining, after doing the testing on his teeth and the DNA testing and that, determining you know who he was, um, as those tests were, you know, with the labs and stuff to to reveal the, you know, exactly what they had to tell us, Emmett Till was buried in a new casket. His original one, it was significant because when Emmett Till uh, was murdered and when his mother saw the condition of his body and she said. The whole world needs to see what they did to my son. They, uh, they, she left the body on display for five days. If you've seen those photos, thousands and thousands and thousands of people walked by that casket over a five day period. His body was covered with glass uh, for a couple of reasons, I assume. One, because of the smell. He'd been in the river for three days. And even though they didn't attempt an embalming, uh, that didn't get rid of the smell. And with that many people filing by, didn't want anybody really touching him and all of that. So they covered his body with a clear glass. When they resumed the body, that glass was still intact. He was uh, intact. He was dry, uh, worried about some possible, uh, there was a high water table at that cemetery and they worried, didn't really know, know what they'd find, but they found a body in pristine condition. And so they took the original casket and put it in storage at the cemetery. And I went there in February of 2007 to the cemetery to see his grave for the first time. And then I asked somebody at the cemetery, is the casket here? And they said yes. And I said, can I see it? At first they were hesitant because there was a blizzard going on that day. I'd never seen anything like it in my life. I think I had three coats on as it was and that cold wind in Chicago was just going right through me. I'd never experienced that, and I, they had to send somebody out, first of all, because I wanted to see the grave. They sent somebody out to, with a pickaxe and just picked around until they found his grave because of all the ice that was out there. So I felt kind of bad about that as I waited in my warm car. This guy was out uh, trying to find the grave, and then I asked him if I could see the casket uh, in the storage. And so they did take this guy in there, and he took the casket down, uncovered it from this... Uh, uh, canvas that was over it, opened it, and left me alone. So there I was, suddenly, I thought back, thousands and thousands and thousands of people filed by that casket and looked in and saw Emmett Till, and now I was suddenly one of them. And it was interesting, when the FBI, uh, when they exhumed the body, they found fingerprints on the casket, on the casket itself and on the glass from back in 1955, they were 50 years old, they were in pristine condition, looked as fresh as they did, one of the people said as fresh as they did in 55. And then I touched that same glass and touched that same lid, and suddenly my fingerprints were added to those thousands from, from decades earlier. So once again, it was a significant moment where I came to know Emma Till's mother, and then a decade later, stood in front of that same casket, looked down myself, and also um, added my fingerprints to that. So suddenly I feel like I'm becoming this part of history in ways I can't explain. And I'm starting to think, am I gonna be able to keep my objective nature as a historian and write about this or is it becoming too personal? In the meantime, I came to know some of Emmett Till's other family members of Emmett Till. 
I want to mention one.